I'm, I'm originally from Denver, so it's nice to come back home. Uh, this is also a nice venue. You are right next to the Butterfly uh, Pavilion. So if you haven't done so, please go over there. You have tarantulas that will crawl on your body. It's a good time, okay? So I'm here today to talk about um, essentially progress in, in quantum computing, and in particular, of course, I'm from IBM. So this will be heavily IBM-focused progress. Um, so let's just get started. Okay, so the first thing to ask ourselves is why are we here? Why are you there? Why are you listening to me talk about quantum computing? And the answer is basically because there has probably been some news story or article telling you that quantum computing is good for something, namely uh, chemical processes, uh, quantum chemistry, financial applications, man manufacturing, logistics, any kind of optimization problem. There's probably been some story um, saying that a quantum computer can do this possibly faster than a classical computer, okay? There are also have been some articles that have a little more meat to them, a little more exciting. Quantum supremacy is the internet broken, all right? Obviously, these kind of things should be taken with a grain of salt. And in fact, any time someone says a quantum computer can go be, uh, do something faster uh, than a classical computer, every article could, should say maybe, if, possibly, okay? Because that is the best way to describe uh, state of the art today. So the question is, what can we actually do today with a quantum computer? Okay. The devices that we have now are what are called, oops, whoop, okay, yeah, sorry. The devices we have uh, today are what are called noisy devices, okay, so the devices have lots of errors on them, and we can, okay, uh-oh, uh-oh, okay, okay, something is going on, okay, so, okay, maybe we can get that, okay, okay, well, while he fixes that, Okay, our devices are noisy, something like that, you just saw, all right? And so the grand goal in quantum computing is to have a device that will correct those errors for you, okay? This is what's called a fault-tolerant quantum computer, okay? We don't have that today, we won't have that tomorrow, we won't have that, let's say, eight to 10 years from now. What we have now are noisy devices, but we don't have to live with that noise, okay? We can do what's called error mitigation to correct the noise in some sense, okay? It's like having a pair of glasses. It doesn't fix your, your vision, but it corrects it, okay? Uh-oh, I guess we're frozen here. Okay, so the devices we have today also have limited effective computational power, okay? They can't do a lot of stuff, okay? So if we actually want to make progress in the near term in quantum computing, what we have to do is we have to come up with algorithms, okay, that take advantage of the fact that our devices are noisy, but we have a small window in which we can do a reasonable computation, okay? So we have to come up with algorithms that fit with inside that window, and those algorithms typically are heuristic algorithms, okay? And in many cases, also hybrid algorithms that take advantage of quantum and classical resources to, uh, to do a computation, okay? And the key here is, is that when you have a heuristic or a hybrid algorithm, okay, you can have a speed up, but that speed up is not provable in the sense that I can mathematically prove it to you that a quantum computer will be faster, okay? So everything I showed you on the previous slide, okay, everything has a maybe or a possibly or a could attached to it, okay, because mathematically you cannot prove it, okay? It may be surprising that the actual first mathematical proof that a quantum algorithm could go faster than any classical algorithm was done a year ago, almost a year ago today, okay? And that was work done at IBM by Sergey Bravi and David Gossett, where they showed that um, in a particular model, you could have a quantum circuit that could do an algorithm provably faster than any classical algorithm to, could, okay? And that was a year ago, okay? So that's kind of where we are today, okay? So, Compared to what people usually talk about, this is kind of the, the Debbie Downer approach, okay? It doesn't sound very exciting, okay? But the roadmap from which this all came, I think we're still frozen. Oh, there's one, okay, sorry, we're not. Okay, the roadmap has actually been very long. So if you consider the history of where we've been, and in particular the last 10 years, it's actually very exciting, okay? So this is kind of the roadmap of, of quantum computing since the very beginning, okay? 1935 was Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen talking about entanglement in, in, in particles flying uh, opposite sides of the universe. 
Bell's inequalities and in the 1970s, people like Charlie Bennett, Ralph Landauer, started to put together the pieces of quantum information science. Okay, as you go on down in the 90s, of course, we have things like Shor's algorithm for factoring prime numbers. Um, experimentally, factoring was done in 2001 at IBM. And then we get down here to 2012, 2017, et cetera, and these are more recent things. Okay, everything highlighted in, in this orangish uh, yellow color is stuff that we've actually done at IBM. Okay. Now, before I get started, I want to point out this 2007 date here in the lower left-hand co corner. So it turns out that we at IBM make uh, superconducting devices. Other people, Google, uh, Intel, uh, Rigetti in California, we all make superconducting devices. The basic building block of all these devices was theoretically proposed in 2007. Okay, so it's only been about a decade that we've actually had the basic building blocks to play with, let alone building them all and making them work in unison. Okay. <clears throat> so this particular roadmap can be uh, decomposed into basically three different pieces. Okay, the first one is what we call the quantum science regime. Okay, and this is the one that started roughly in the 1960s. And this is the regime where people started to create the fundamental theoretical uh, uh, foundations and experimental demonstrations of quantum computing. Okay, and this is a, a thing that will continue as far into the future as we can see. People will still do this. The middle regime is what we call quantum ready. Okay. Quantum computing is a completely different paradigm of computing from classical computing. It's completely different, right? So if you have something completely different, you have to learn the rules, okay? So we have to have people learn the rules, okay? And this is something that is going on right now. And of course, sometime in the future, let's say five to eight years from now, okay, we'll have computers that in some tasks will be able to beat classical computers, okay? And then from there on out, we'll start to scale out things and, and hopefully reach a, a fault tolerant quantum computer. Okay, so all the dates you see on here have approximate marks on them, except for one, which is 2016, okay? So the idea here is, is that, again, if quantum computing is this new beast that we have to understand, okay, if I want people to take advantage of it, I need to actually have a quantum computer in their hands to play with, okay? Otherwise, you, you, you can't get quantum ready, okay? And in 2016, the reason that that date is there is because in 2016, May of 2016, uh, IBM put the first quantum computer on the cloud. This is what we call the IBM quantum experience. That is a picture of what it looked like. Okay, <clears throat> and from today's standards, this was fairly rudimentary. Okay, it was a five qubit device that you could graphically drag and drop circuits on and say run. Okay, now <clears throat> if anyone knows anything about uh, quantum computing, a five qubit device corresponds to a 32 by 32 matrix, right? Your cell phone can handle this, right? And so why is this interesting if it's 32 by 32 matrix? The idea is not so much that it's a five qubit thing. I mean, that is interesting in itself because it was the first quantum processor, but that processor was online 24 hours a day, seven days a week for years, okay? Stable, anyone could use it. That stability is the key, okay? There's software infrastructure as well, but stability is the key, okay? So if you ask yourself today, here at the end of 2019, how many companies have quantum computers accessible via the cloud? The answer is three, okay, as of today. There's IBM, there's Rigetti in California, and there's also Alibaba in China, okay, right? So it is actually very difficult to make a stable quantum device, okay? And then three years ago, we demonstrated that this is possible, right? So from then on out, people have been able to play with quantum computers. If you move to today, this is all the devices we've had available up until today, okay, as part of our IBM network of, of quantum computers. And you can see a couple different devices, okay. These guys um, that we call Tenerife in Yorktown, these were the first five qubit devices. They have this bow tie uh, topology. Okay, so what you're looking at here is the circles are qubits. These are these two level systems that we use to do the computations. The lines that connect the qubits are lines that say between that pair of qubits you can do an entangling gate. Okay, so you can do interesting quantum things between those qubits. If there's no line, you can't directly do that interaction. Okay, later we had larger devices, 16 qubit ladder type devices, and then about two years ago we introduced our uh, 20 qubit uh, line of devices. And these all have names, city names associated to them, so Austin, Tokyo, et cetera. 
And then just a little while ago, we had a 53 qubit device that we call Rochester online. Okay, so right now, all the ones that you see in this yellow color are the ones that are online now. So we have 14 devices uh, that people can play with. And some are, of course, available um, uh, for, for clients as part of our IBM network. Others, um, particularly ones down here, are available to just play with for free online. Okay. Now, one gauge of the success of such a program is do people use it? Okay, so you can ask yourself, how many quantum circuits have people pl uh, played with since 2016? Okay, and this is the answer. As of 5 a.m. Eastern time yesterday, 114 billion quantum circuits have been run on our devices. Okay, these are actual people actually running things. Okay, this is the first time we've actually disclosed this number. Okay, but the reason I wanted to show it is because it is an impressive number. All right, by any gauge, that is a pretty cool number. You can also look at it in terms of papers, right? People like writing papers. We've had 200 and plus papers uh, using our hardware, sometimes simulators, but mostly hardware, okay? These are all external papers. These are not IBM papers, okay? And so most of these were people who played with our devices for free and were able to write papers about it, okay? Now, you saw the 114 billion, you see 200 papers. It turns out that the ratio of people who use actual quantum devices to simulators, classical simulators, is about three to one, okay? And the ratio made a crossover um, between mostly simulator and uh, just a few actual quantum uh, usage to now this three to one ratio just in March of this year, okay? So as of this year, people start to use our actual devices more and more. And the reason for this is as, as follows. So here I have a collection of devices and some parameters about them, okay? So the parameters here, we have a blue dot, um, which is a dot that represents the error in our entangling gates. Uh, the, gate, the gates that we use to entangle our qubits are called uh, controlled knot gates or CX gates. The blue circles represent the error rates associated with these guys on this axis here. There's also a yellow circle, which is our readout error rate. So when you uh, do a quantum computation, you actually have to measure the uh, qubits at the end, okay, which takes the quantum problem and makes it a normal classical problem. Th there's an error associated with that. That's what these yellow circles mean. Okay, and then uh, there's two characteristic time scales um, for a quantum device. One is called T1, which is the green square here. T1 is a measure of the amount of time it takes uh, for a qubit that's been excited to go back down to the ground state because the environment the noise of the surrounding environment has taken energy away from your system. The other one, which is called a T2 time, is a, uh, the amount of time in which the environment comes and scrambles all your information randomly, okay? So every computation you wanna do has to be within these two time scales, okay? So that kind of sets a limit, okay? So what I've done here is I've plotted all these error rates and times from uh, 2017 up until essentially a, a month or so ago for these devices here. So this IBM QX2 is the first device shown here, and we go down the column from left to right, top to bottom, okay, in terms of age, okay? And you see a couple things, okay? You see that these T1 and T2 times, hopefully it shows, okay, okay I guess it doesn't. These T1, T2 times you see increase as a function of time. There we go, okay? So what this means is that as our devices mature and mature, these coherence times become longer, which means you can do a longer computation. At the same time, these gate errors here, so these errors um, you would like to have as small as possible, they are also going down at the same time. So our gates are getting better and we could do more and more of them in, in, in this coherence window, okay? Which is uh, the thing you want to see. Okay. We can also look at this a different way, okay? So instead of showing you just the potpourri of devices, what I'm doing here is I'm looking at the controlled knot error rates for our 20 qubit devices as a function of time. So Austin was our first 20 qubit device about two years ago now. And what this is showing you is this is showing you a very wide distribution, okay? What you would like to see is a distribution that is very sharply peaked and you would like it as peaked as close to zero as possible, 
right? So you can see for our first device, that was not the case, right? This thing goes way out here. I actually had to chop some off to fit it on the plot, okay? So our first 20 qubit device was horrible, okay? But you learn something each revision. Our second revision, which was called Tokyo, was better. Third revision, Poughkeepsie and Johannesburg were even better. As we go down, these are all 20 qubit devices, but we learn something every time. And you can see that, that these start to get very sharply peaked, and the peak is closer and closer to zero. Okay, so our devices are getting better and better as a function of time. Okay, if you want to look at details, this is a detailed error analysis of one of these devices, a Voibligin device. So this is a 20 qubit device. So again, the, the circles here are qubits and they're color coded, okay? The color code for the circles shows you the error rate of doing a particular uh, single qubit rotation, which is called a Hadamard gate. Okay, so the brighter the color, the worse it is. And then the lines here again are the lines that show you the entangling gates between the qubits. And again, the brighter those lines, the worse it is. And then here we see readout errors. So these are the measurement errors, okay? So these things kind of tell you the properties of your devices, and again, they get better and better as a function of time. Okay. So we can ask ourselves, why do things keep getting better and better over time? Okay. And the reason, at least IBM's perceived reason for this, is because we have a different strategy for doing things. Okay. And the basic difference between us and everyone else is the following. Our qubits essentially can be represented as nonlinear LC oscillators, okay? And in particular, they're fixed frequency oscillators that we call transmons, okay? So this is what we use at IBM. Basically, everyone else uses a, what we call a flux tunable transmon device. So this looks very similar, but you can see there's an extra arm here with an extra Josephson junction. So what this means is if I put a magnetic field in this loop here, I can effectively tune the inductance of this LC circuit, okay? And that changes the frequency of my device, okay? These guys are much easier to play with, but they have some cons, okay? So if you switch to these fixed frequency transmons, you have some benefits. The first is stability, okay? There's no stray magnetic fields. This is a very good thing. They have very high coherence. You have large T1 and T2 times. Another benefit that's often overlooked is we have a single set of electronics that controls one qubit and two qubit uh, rotations. Okay, this is very important because it means we have one set of control electronics that we have to optimize versus two. Okay, there are some cons, however. The first one is what's called a frequency collision. Okay, if you actually wanna do entangling gates on our devices, the frequency of these uh, qubits has to be relatively far apart, but they're fixed frequency, okay? So if they're too close, we're kind of stuck and we have to play some tricks uh, to get it to work. We call that frequency collisions. And we also have a very stringent uh, set of parameters on our junction fabrication, because again, they're fixed frequency. Once they're made, we're stuck with them, okay? And that's the difference between flux tu tunable ones. Okay. So everything we've talked about up until now have been things like single qubit properties, T1, T2 times. And you can ask yourself, well, I don't really care about these things. I really wanna do an algorithm. Do these things tell me anything about how good I could perform on you know, this algorithm or this algorithm? And the answer is yes, but you have like eight different properties that you'd have to go through, eight different plots and put it all together. So is there some better way to gauge the computational power of a quantum device than looking at eight different charts and trying to piece it together? And the answer is yes, okay? And the idea is uh, what we call the quantum volume, okay? This is an algorithm, or a benchmark, I should say, uh, developed uh, at IBM, okay? That tries to encapsulate every possible error into a single number, and is a computational benchmark, okay? So I'll explain what this means in a second, but the definition is the, basically the quantum volume of a particular piece of, of quantum hardware is the largest quantum computational space a device can explore, okay? I purposely have put explore here in quotation marks, okay, because I do not want to get into the details of this during the talk, okay? You can ask me after the end, okay? It has a very specific meaning, but let's just say explore for now, okay? The dimensionality of this space, okay, is what my quantum volume measures, and the dimensionality of the space scales as two to the n, where n is the number of qubits, okay? If you know something about quantum mechanics, 
This is essentially the size of the Hilbert space of my quantum device. Okay. So as any good benchmark, larger is better. I want to get a larger quantum volume. So how do I do that? Okay. Well, there's lots of things you could do. You could have very high fidelity two qubit gates, right? low single qubit errors, long coherence times, this T1 and T2 I mentioned, low measurement errors, we looked at that as well. You could also run all your gates in parallel if possible. Okay, that's not always possible on hardware, but if you have good hardware, it's possible. Good connectivity, I should be able to do entangling gates between all my qubits. Uh, if you have a trapped ion device, that's possible. If you have a superconducting device, it's not. Okay, so trapped ions would be better in that sense. Minimal crosstalk, if I do an operation over here, it shouldn't affect this operation over here. All right, and then two that are often overlooked, you have to have smart classical software that optimizes your quantum circuits. Okay, we'll talk about that a bit later. That's very important. And finally, stable control electronics. Okay. These are all different parameters. They can all come in different charts. The idea of quantum volume is all of these guys, which, is, which is essentially can become uh, just error rates, okay? You take all of these guys and you capture them in a single number, okay? That is the quantum volume. So let me show you how this works, okay? So we're gonna make an analogy. So we're gonna come up with something called the tourist volume, all right? So now the idea here is everything on the last slide I said was an error rate, all right? Like any good rate, you can take the inverse of it and that sets a time scale, all right? So error rates set a time scale on which you can explore this quantum computational space, okay? The shorter the time, the less space you could explore. That's the basic idea, all right? So we're gonna set up a tourist who wants to explore all of New York City, okay? What we're gonna say is that tourist wants a tourist volume instead of quantum volume, that's the size of New York City, okay? So if they want to do that, Right? They have lots of places they have to go and visit. Right? And you also need the Statue of Liberty. Right? So let's play a game. So let's do experiment number one. Let's say we take our tourists and we say, you have 24 hours to explore New York City. Okay? If you've ever been to New York City, you know this is impossible. Right? But if you place your hotel right there and you run really fast, you can get all that central, uh, central region there. All right? But that's not all of New York City. Right? So you can't do it. Right, so now let's go to experiment number two. I give them two days, right? Well, in two days, I can cover the exact same ground I could cover in one day, and now I can get, for example, the Museum of Natural History, the Apollo Theater, and the stuff up north, but again, this is not everything, okay? And for the sake of time, we'll give them three days, and say in three days, right, you would be exhausted, but you could cover everything, okay? So you, in this case, in three days, you could cover all of New York City, okay? and our tourist would have his tourist volume the size of New York City. So the message here is given enough time, okay, which in the, the quantum language is a lower error rate, you can explore a given space of a given size. All right? There's two more situations that we need to discuss. All right? Experiment number four, we're gonna give them six days instead of three, but we say you have to explore the same space. Right? So now you're going to the Statue of Liberty twice, you're going to the museum twice. As a tourist, this is not a good thing, right? You're wasting your time, right? So you're just seeing the same stuff twice. There's no change in your tourist volume. All right? Now let's say we give them the exact same three days, but we enlarge the space, right? I could barely cover New York City in three days. I can't cover an extended space, so my tourist volume again doesn't change, okay? So the basic idea here is if you are a smart tourist and you want to cover the most stuff possible, you need to expand your uh, tourist area at the same time while giving yourself more time, right? You have to expand both axes at the same time. And it turns out this quantum volume algorithm is essentially the quantum version of a tourist, right? This benchmark explores both lower error rates and increased space at the same time, okay? So again, in our language, increased time means lower error rates, and increased space means more qubits, okay? So the other reason to do this particular benchmark, not only does it make sense uh, intuitively, okay, it is also platform independent, 
Okay, anyone who has a quantum computer that uses gates can run this algorithm. Okay, and, and people have tried. Um, so Rigetti quantum computers in, in, in California, they also use the quantum volume. Google just introduced it into their software. Okay, and if you have a trapped ion device, you can also implement it there. Okay, each of these guys will have different numbers because in that huge list of things, some will, you'll win on, some you'll lose on. Okay. Now, we actually did this on our devices for the first time a year or so ago, and these are the results. Okay, so again, let me explain stuff here. All right, so we have four different devices. The first was a five qubit device that was released in 2017 called Tenerife. We had two in 2018, one was Tokyo, Poughkeepsie, and finally one that was released in January of this year that we called System 1. I'll show a picture at the end. All right, we took all these guys and we ran them through this quantum volume thing. All right. <clears throat> so the y-axis here, this is a particular uh, metric to say, did you succeed at this particular quantum volume? The main idea is, is you want to be above this dashed line. Okay. At the bottom here, uh, this is a, a, a slightly different way of saying quantum volume. So this two, three, and four here, this is the number of qubits used in the algorithm. So the quantum volume here is again, two to the power of the number of qubits. So two to the two, so this is quantum volume four, eight, and 16. Okay, just rewritten a slightly different way. So you can see for a quantum volume of four, all four of the devices are above the dashed line. Okay, so they've all satisfied that. As we go up to a quantum volume of eight, you can see the 2017 device didn't quite make the cut, right? So this 2017 Tenerife device is stuck at a quantum volume of four. As we go higher here to this uh, quantum volume 16 guy here, you can see that only the IBM Q system one device was able to reach a quantum volume of 16, okay? So these two guys have a quantum volume of eight, only this guy has a quantum volume of 16, okay? And this is how we do the measurements, okay? So the main lesson here is from 2017 to 2019, as we improve the devices, we're able to double this quantum volume every year, okay? So this is an exponential scaling, and this is kind of the benchmark we hold ourselves to um, when releasing uh, newer devices. Every year, we need to double the quantum volume, right? So in 2020, we need to get quantum volume 32, 64, 128, et cetera, okay? It's a very challenging benchmark because it's yes or no, okay? It's very difficult to do. So now, I focused a lot about hardware, uh, okay, up till now. I wanna switch gears to software because software is, is almost equally as important as hardware, okay? So this quantum volume 16 guy here, it turns out that if we didn't have smart classical software to optimize our circuits, we would not get this result, okay? So software is very important. The software that we have at IBM is what we call Kizkit. Okay, it is separated into a collection of elements. Okay. The first is what we call Terra. Okay, this is an element that allows you to build circuits, it allows you to build pulses. You optimize your circuits and then you submit them to devices. Okay, it's kind of the entry point for working with the quantum hardware. We also have classical simulators, emulators and debuggers. This is called AIR. Uh, you can do uh, noise mitigation calibration. I'll show an example of this uh, using Ignis. And finally, there is an application stack that we call Aqua, um, which you can run things like uh, doing quantum chemistry calculations, machine learning, et cetera. Okay. So here is some of the stuff you can do in Terra, right? So we're using Jupyter Notebooks. Everything is in Python, right? So you can construct circuits in a fairly uh, simple syntax. Here we're creating a five qubit GHG state, which is a highly entangled state. You can now take this thing, run it on our hardware. This is an actual result on the hardware. Uh, if this worked, you should see peaks at all zeros and all ones. So indeed, this created an entangled state, right? You can view uh, device uh, characteristics. I've showed you some of these pictures already, um, but you can generate them in our software. And again, you can optimize circuits. Optimizing circuits for noisy devices is, is like the meat of what a, a classical software suite should do. And this is just a section of the pipeline for optimization. This is actually, I think, one quarter of the entire thing, right? So it's actually very complex how you go and you optimize these circuits. All right. So let's talk a bit more about how you actually do that. 
All right, so the idea is what we call circuit transpilation. It's not compilation, it's transpilation because the input is a circuit, the output is the same, it's a circuit. So it's transpilation, not compilation. <coughs> so we have limited numbers of qubits, we have lots of noise, right? So the goal is to optimize our circuits, shrink them down essentially as much as possible uh, under these tight constraints that we have to live with at the moment. Right? So here's an example of a circuit, all right? We want to take this circuit and we want to make it run on, for example, this uh, five qubit bow tie device. Right? There's lots of ways you can do this, infinite numbers of ways actually. There is a good way, which takes the input circuit and makes it roughly the same size. All right? And it's good because if you look at what comes out, the correct answer has the largest peak. Okay? That's what you can think of as good. There is a bad version, okay, which you can see there's a lot more gates in this particular circuit versus the input. And if I go and I actually measure this thing, if I could see it here, you would see that you can't actually distinguish the uh, correct result from the noise, all right? So manipulating your circuits and making them as short as possible in some cases can mean the difference between I got an answer and I got noise, all right? So the way we do this is what's called the transpiler architecture. And so you have something called a pass manager and it controls a bunch of things called passes, and each pass does a very specific thing and only that thing. So for example, the first one would take your circuit and convert it into a, an equivalent circuit that's written in terms of what we call a basis set of gates, okay? If you have a quantum computer, it can't do anything on the planet. It can do maybe five or six different gates. So if you give it something, you have to decompose it into that set. Then you have to choose a mapping between your virtual qubits and your physical qubits on your device. Uh, in the case of superconducting devices, we have to actually match the topology using swaps. And then finally you go and you kind of clean up everything by trying to compress all your gates together, okay? So these guys do all those things and it's all controlled by the pass manager. This guy controls all the complexity and it looks at properties of your circuits, things like what is the depth of the circuit? You can think of depth as the length of the circuit, um, things like layouts, fixed point conditions, it keeps track of these things uh, and, and tries to optimize your circuit as best as possible. Okay. Now at IBM we make superconducting devices but this entire pipeline uh, does not need to be very specific for superconducting architectures. In fact, you can use it for others. Uh, the other game in town at the moment is trapped ions. And so recently we added the ability to go to trapped ions. So you can take an input circuit, right, again, uh, this is the output written in terms of our normal language. And just by saying, I want to go to this trapped ion device or this superconducting device, it automatically knows uh, to convert it into a different set of gates and different sets of optimizations, all right? So <clears throat> this entire pipeline is hardware agnostic. It doesn't really care at the end of the day. You write your circuit once in whatever gate set you want, and then it'll convert it for you. And it's easy to extend. So this entire trapped ion thing took three days to do. Um, so it's quite simple uh, to do that. Okay. <clears throat> so the devices we have, they have what we call access levels associated with them. So the first one is what's called uh, the gate level access. It basically, it just tells you that this user can run gates. We have another one that's called pulse level access, which we'll talk about in just a sec. But it basically allows you to program the quantum computer at the fundamental Hamiltonian level. And this opens up a lot of uh, interesting physics like optimal control <clears throat> and Hamiltonian tomography. And finally, um, certain users can also do reservations. All right, so if you want to reserve time on a quantum device, you can actually do that. Okay. So what I wanna do is focus on the pulse one because the pulse one is pretty cool. Okay. It has a particular name, we call it open pulse. And so the idea is we have our quantum hardware, but what we've done is we've taken the hardware and we've abstracted everything away into just a bunch of control channels, right? So you have a drive channel that essentially drives your, your, your qubits, does rotations, control channels that essentially turn on these entangling gates, measurement channels that obviously measure our qubits, acquire channels that set up our digital uh, acquisition uh, uh, protocols, and then finally all the results are stored in memory slots. And so this abstraction from the fundamental physics into things just like memory slots and channels okay, allows you to do very cool stuff. Essentially, you have full control of our device at the Hamiltonian level, right? 
So if, if you're a physicist, this means that you can actually play with all the terms in your Hamiltonian. Okay, so you can do very cool low-level physics. <clears throat> Just a few examples. These are examples you could actually run yourself. Uh, you can actually do uh, simple calibrations. If you want to calibrate your own gates, there's a basic way to do this. This is uh, calibrating a, a, a bit flip gate, essentially. You can also look at uh, measurement discrimination, so you can actually see how our devices decide when you measure, did I get a zero or a one as, as the measurement bit? All right, you can play with things like that. All right. And so this is kind of the, the, the new toy in town. It's pretty cool. It's still actively being improved because it turns out abstracting away quantum devices is hard. Okay, so we're still actively working on this. Okay, and we also have things like a simulator that will actually uh, do the noise modeling and, and give you the same output for you. <clears throat> now, as an application of this, I want to look at something from quantum chemistry. Okay, so this is from a, a, a Nature paper uh, uh, almost two years ago now, uh, again from IBM, where we looked at what is the ground state energy of various molecules as a function of the interatomic distance. So this is the interatomic distance here. The colored lines are what you would get from just normal classical simulation methods. Okay, and the white dots are what we see on the quantum computer uh, when we did that paper. And so if you can notice that the white dots are always above the line, okay, which is not what you would want to see. Right? You would like our dots to be exactly on that line. Okay? The reason they're not on that line is because of noise. Okay? We always have noise, all right, and that is corrupting the result. Okay? But again, if we have noise, we don't have to live with it. All right? We just have to work around it. <clears throat> so this brings us to error mitigation. One of the cool things you can do is you can take advantage of the fact that many, but not all, most uh, quantum algorithms you want to do operate on what are called expectation values. These are just average values of some quantity. Right? So if you could run your quantum circuit many, many times, okay, collect your outputs, which are just bit strings in our case, and average over them, um, you, would get, you would get your answer. So the idea here is if you could, if you could compute these mean values as a function of different values of your noise, you could essentially take these two values and extrapolate from them and get what would be the effective ideal result if there was no noise. All right. So the problem with that is if you have a device that has one noise, you, you can't play with the noise. It's just, it is what it is, okay? So how do you actually take advantage of this? Well, the answer is you can play a trick. And the trick is the following. If your noise is time translation invariant, okay, which is pretty much what you would expect it to be if the noise was behaving nicely, then changing the error rate is equivalent to rescaling the dynamics. All right, so this is the original dynamics here is a set of pulse sequences on my qubits. All right, this gives me this value here. What I've done is I've taken this and I've essentially stretched it out in time, okay, which I would need to do using this pulse level control. It's the same sequence stretched out in time. If I stretch it out in time, again, if my noise is well behaved, this is effectively like increasing my error rate. This gives me the point up here. I draw the line and I extrapolate back. That is the game we play. And again, this requires pulse level control. <clears throat> if you do this, then this is what you get. Here again is this 2017 result. No error correction, sorry, error mitigation. And then if you come down here, if you use that trick I just showed you, again, that requires pulse level control, right? You get a 10x improvement in your result, and you can see that they are basically on the line, okay? So with noisy devices, you have to work around the noise in some sense, okay? And you have to learn these tricks, okay? And these kind of tricks are embedded in our software, okay? So you can take advantage of these in your own experiments. All right. <clears throat> so, that is all stuff you could do in our Terra element. I would run out of time if I talked about everything. So I just want to splash um, a screen up here. Um, all the details are at kiskit.org, the, the, the web page for our, our, our software. So <clears throat> again, we have simulators. Okay. The basic idea is when you first do quantum uh, computing, you build a circuit, you run it through a simulator, you make sure you got the, the correct answer. You run it through another simulator with noise, and then you try to run it on the hardware. That's the ideal pipeline. So simulators are still needed. 
Air is where we provide our high performance scalable uh, quantum simulators. Um, <clears throat> we also host them on the cloud. They scale as, as high as you want to take them, let's say 40, 45 qubits, okay? You can do very easy noise modeling of a device. You can, you, can, uh, you can tell our software which device you're targeting. It will automatically make a noise profile and run it for you. The Ignis element, again, if you want to look at the very low level characteristics of a quantum device, you can. These T1 and T2 times, there is a recipe for computing them. You can compute it using this software. Uh, things like the quantum volume I just showed you, it's automated now. You can just say, give me the quantum volume for this device. Okay, in, in this particular software, we'll do that. Other things like randomized benchmarking, probably outside the scope of this audience, you can also do things like that. All right. And then finally, Aqua. Um, this is where all the applications sit. So if you don't want to know the details of how a quantum algorithm actually works, but you just want to solve quantum chemistry, you just want to solve machine learning, um, this is where you would want to go. And you, there's a whole bunch of different algorithms that are hidden under the hood. You just give it the input and it will give you the output. Okay. <clears throat> so having software is pretty cool, but you can make life a bit easier if you want to by hosting everything on the cloud. Okay. So we've actually done that. The original IBM quantum experience was in 2016. Earlier this year, we gave it a refresh. All right, so this is version two, essentially, of the IBM quantum experience. Now, everything is on the cloud, right? We have our little uh, graphical circuit composer, but also we have, like, Jupyter Notebooks. All of our software is already integrated. There's no installation. So this is what it looks like, provided we have time. I'll actually play with this in just a sec. <clears throat> so if, if, if you're a member of the IBM network, you can manage accounts if you're a personal User, you can also play with your account uh, description. We have Jupyter Notebooks where you can actually play with all of our software. You don't have to install it. Um, you can pick up where you left off. Everything is saved on the IBM Cloud. It's all encrypted. Um, so you can just run something. If something runs for 24 hours, just let it run. Close your notebook, go, go play outside. Right? <clears throat> it's also much faster than doing it from home because we have direct connections between our software and our hardware. Okay. And so for things like quantum chemistry, this makes a very big difference. All right, and then you can also manage teams and collect uh, usage statistics. Okay. So I normally have lots of slides about that, but I say, well, what the hell, let's play. Right? So let's actually play with this. So here it is. Right? So this is the IBM quantum experience. All right, so this is what you would see if you first got on here. So you can see it recognizes me. Here on the uh, right side here, you can see a bunch of different devices, right? I work here, so I have a lot of quantum devices. Um, but you can see devices. You can click on them if you want. Let's see. This is the 53 qubit device. You can see what it looks like. You, it's kind of hard on the screen. You can also see the error rates, and et cetera. So you can access your devices. We can play with a graphical uh, Notebook or a, a circuit if we like. So let's go to the circuit composer. Let's make a new circuit. So this is the graphical composer. Um, so uh, I showed you a five qubit entangled state. So let's just make one. So we need a Hadamard gate. So I can drag and drop a Hadamard. There's one controlled not gate. That is the entangling gate on our hardware. All right. So this. Just a Hadamard and CX, this has a particular name. This generates what's called a Bell state. Okay, if you don't know what a Bell state is, please go to Wikipedia. This is like the fundamental entangling uh, state in all of quantum computing. This is like the hello world. Okay, but we don't want to do hello world. So instead of entangling two qubits, let's try to do five. Right, so there is a circuit that will entangle all five. And then we got to measure everything, so let's measure. All right, so there's our circuit. We'll save it, and then let's run it. I don't know, what do we want to run it on? Mm. <laughs> now let's just run it on this. All right, so I've picked a device. 
So it was sent, so now it's waiting down here in our pending results. Hopefully it comes back fast. This is always the problem with doing things live. <laughs> right, so this is running on a particular five uh, qubit device. There it is. All right, so there's the result. Again, this is a, a five uh, uh, qubit entangled state. So this should be, uh, uh, in this case, a 50% combination of all zeros in all ones, okay? And you can see it's not quite a 50-50 uh, combination. Again, this is because of noise. In, in particular, this is what you would expect. So you see a lot of junk here at the bottom. That is probably mostly er uh, uh, errors in the measurement. Um, but you can see that the all zeros uh, one is, is a bit higher than the all ones. And this is just the fact of the environment comes and takes energy out of your system. All zeros is the lowest energy state. All ones is the highest energy state. So it sucks some energy out. Okay. <clears throat> so that is an example of what you can do. We can also come over here uh, to the Jupyter Notebooks and we can load this one up. <clears throat> so this is the Jupyter Notebook interface. You can come over here. It's got everything kind of preloaded uh, that you would like. Um, so we'll just uh, import all that here. It's going to connect and load my account. Hopefully. I have a large account, so this might take a while. Well, maybe not. Hopefully it loads. While it loads, what I'm doing here is from this guy here. If it works, it'll pop up. What I'm doing is I'm selecting a particular device. This is the, the same device I ran on before. Okay, it worked. This uh, is a, a device called Valencia. Here are the details of the Valencia device, right? So this is a five qubit device. Its quantum volume is 16, right? <clears throat> Uh, it has one job on it, and you can see a, a bunch of different things. You can look at all the qubit properties, right? So anyone can go in and start looking at the properties. You can see the, the frequencies. You can see this T1 and T2 time I mentioned. You can see error rates on the devices and readout errors. You can also see things like the error rates of our entangling gates. Uh, you can see the pictures I drew before. Um, this is the error map of the device. Um, it's just a different color scheme because it's a white background. You can go look and you can see at the error rates. So you can see our average C0 uh, error rate is about 0.94%. Uh, uh, Measurement errors, the average is about 3.2%. We can go, we can go down here. We can make the exact same uh, circuit. Right, so there it is. Right, so it's the exact same circuit we made before. So what I'll do is this circuit is not available to run on the device as it stands now. I have to manipulate it and in, in, in transpile it. So we have this function called transpile, which takes my input circuit, which I just called QC for quantum circuit, gives me a new one, and I have to tell it which device to target. So I did, and let's draw it. There it is. So this is the circuit that uh, uh, will actually match the topology. You see there's a bunch of extra gates in there, and that's because, again, we can't do entangling gates between every qubit, okay? Only a few, so we have to move things around. So this guy here is moving things around. These three here are moving things around, all right? So we can run this, all right? So now execute is sending this to the device. If I come up here, there's a little widget that floats up here. It tells me that it's running, it tells me which device. This is the unique job ID. Right. And so when this is actually done, it'll say, hey, you're done. Okay, and hopefully we're done fast. There it is, it's done. Hopefully we get the right answer. Oh, there it is. Right, and so you can see you get a very similar result we got before. If we have time, I don't know if it'll work. Let's, let's just remove all this. Let's do it on the 53 qubit device because we can. So 
So uh, Ji Jun said, you know, there's this, this big debate between IBM and Google about quantum supremacy. It's not really true. Um, there, there, there is no debate. We can run on a 53 qubit device. You can't run on theirs. All right, so here it is. So here's the 53 qubit device. You can look at it as well. It's got a lot more properties than the other one. All right, so you gotta keep going. All right, so we won't, you can look at the error map. It's a version one device, the, error, it, the errors are not very good. Um, but again, as we saw with the 20 qubit devices, you learn a lot of lessons. All right, so that's the same circuit. I will not show you the transpiled one because it'll be this huge mess. So let's just run it. All right, so we executed it. So this device tends to be busy, as one can imagine, so we will see. The nice thing is I can make reservations, so we shall see. Um, So this guy go through at some point here, it says it's running. If it wasn't running, it would tell me I'm in line. So it, it must be running. <laughs> oh, there it is. So it's done. Oh, see, this one's a bit noisier. All right, so again, we have the two main peaks here and here, but you can see there's a lot more noise, okay? <clears throat> and this is what one would naively expect because the 53 qubit device has more noise than the five qubit device. It's much easier to make a five qubit device than a 50 plus qubit device, right? So the answer is more noisy, but you can see that the primary uh, peaks are still the ones you would expect, okay? So again, you can play with all this yourself If you w would like to, it's quantumcomputing.ibm.com, okay? Everything you saw is from that URL, all right? You can do all the same stuff I just did uh, in, in five minutes, okay? Also, I mentioned system one. This is the picture of system one. If you ever come to visit us at the Watson Research Lab in, in, in Yorktown, in New York, uh, you can come to aisle 12. You can see this thing, it looks exactly like that. They will turn down the lights to make sure it looks exactly like that. Okay, it's a pretty cool piece of technology. Okay, so with that, I'd like to say thanks. Kudos to the Paul for the courage to run the um, actual online demo. That's one thing. And second, I have to mention that um, although I'm from the same institution, IBM Research, today I'm wearing CEDA's hat. So, Paul's comments give me a challenge to invite Google people <laughs> to have a debate on that issue, but let's table that discussion. Okay, I think we have a time for just one question from the audience. Yes. Okay. Oh, so what your friend is, is mentioning, so the, 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 the question was, um, you need a half a million qubits to do anything interesting. Um, and the response to that is, your friend was talking about fault-tolerant quantum computing, where we can do error correction. So if you actually want to correct errors, you can't use just plain qubits, the physical qubits. You have to create what's called a logical qubit. And creating a logical qubit is essentially taking an ensemble of physical qubits, let's say 50, and essentially encoding the state of a single qubit in that ensemble. Okay, so the number 50 is, is something I pulled out of my head, and the reason is because when you look at error correction, there's no, there's not just one way to do error correction, and there are these coefficients in front of everything that have a lot of unknowns. So, um, for example, I showed, um, this color-coded picture of our devices over time with this uh, C0 error rate, and it gets peaked and peaked and peaked. Um, the number of qubits you need to encode one logical qubit depends very strongly on what that number is. 
So you would like that number to be something like uh, 10 to the minus four. Uh, and then let's say you can do, let's say 50 qubits for one logical. So it's hard to make 50 qubits right now, right? So if I had to make 50 qubits for one qubit, right, I have to really be able to expand in size. And so that number of like half a million is, is something uh, that is probably related to error correction. Um, if you wanna do something like factorization, right, these require huge numbers of qubits um, and they have to be these fault tolerant logical ones, right? So this is why it's, it's well into the future. Yes. So including everything together, uh, so what, what is true advantage on the power consumption point of view? Is it better or it's worse? Uh, oh, I'm sure it's horrible. <laughs> um, then, so then, then how hard is the uh, realistic uh, so, the real system? Oh, but it, so it's like, it, it's like any other technology though, right? So I mean, if you look at CPUs a decade ago, they would suck more power. Um, you know, Pentium 4, I remember Pentium 4 was 4 gigahertz, but it would fry anything, right? You could fry an egg on it. So, I mean, as a function of time, things become better. Um, <clears throat> so, oh yeah, but you, so, but also there's things that you don't think of, like you have to have uh, pumps for circulating helium. You have to have the entire classical control electronics rack, um, no, all these things. No, no, I'm saying these are also so things in the error budget. Yeah. Oh, you're, point of view. Well, I mean, so the question is, are you going to have one of these sitting under your desk? And the answer is no. Yeah. Um, so as a function of time, things become better. So our, our own electronics become better. Um, but it is something where they require a lot of power. I, I, it's, let's say, 40 kilowatts um, covering basically everything. Um, it depends on the size of the device, too. Um, but again, all these things come down as, as you mature your technology. Um, but conversely, um, even if you are 40 kilowatt, 100 kilo, you know, some number like that, um, even if you're doing that, if you can solve a problem that was unsolvable before, right, then you win, right? I mean, that, at the end of the day, that's the, that's the benchmark. Okay, let me pause there, and this concludes our session. Um, David has an announcement to make. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Thanks to CIDA uh, for a great lunch and the keynote. Let's thank them again. Uh, our next session starts uh, at 1.45, but before that, um, I just want to have a quick announcement. Uh, you know, we know that CIDA and uh, ACM SIGDA are two main sponsors of ICCAT. So we had a great lunch uh, hosted by CIDA and the keynote at uh, uh, this tonight, we also have uh, SIGTA's uh, uh, annual member meeting after the reception uh, at 6.45, between 6.45 to 8.30. So they also serve food and then you can meet, uh, you know, various SIGTA EC members and all, all kinds of activities there. So uh, please also uh, prepare to uh, go there as well. Okay, so uh, with that, uh, so the next session starts in 10 minutes. All right, thank you.
Pirata, poco de robar, pequeña música. 